Hello and welcome back to another episode of One Hand Made. So today we're going to be doing something called compound scroll sawing. And basically the idea is that you create a pattern, you scroll saw it this way, then you scroll saw it this way, and it creates a three-dimensional shape. So I have two patterns here that I'm looking at. Ignore the thing on the top. Um, but on the left there, it's a really cool kind of teardrop pattern. Uh, and then on the right, we have an infinity sign. So uh, we're going to give it a go and see what's going to happen. Well, I did a terrible job explaining what we're actually going to be doing, which is we're going to be making a necklace in the shape of an infinity sign in three dimensions using a scroll saw. So sit back, enjoy this episode as we make something really quite pretty. So we're going to start by taking this wood that I've chosen and really uh, making sure it's milled up and completely square over to the planer. Here we have now, we need to get this face to be flat compared to this one. And you would think, okay, let's just put it right through the planer. But we can't do that because the planer needs to be, has its rollers uh, wide, and if I put this in there, it would just go I know this because I've done it before. We're gonna put both pieces approximately like this, and then we're going to double side sticky tape them down and then run some scrap two by or something like that uh, around here, across here, so that then it pulls it through. We should be all good. Here we go. Because I have no fingernails to speak of, these little, these guys are super helpful for me. They are called tweezers, Tim. One hand tip right there for you folks. So adding to what I was saying just a moment ago, we're gonna be using these things that I'll call runners. And the idea is that they actually will sit proud of the actual work pieces there to span across the compression rollers inside the planer. If you are not familiar with planing, there's actually these rollers that push the material down and pull it through against the blades and don't let it slip. So if we had just this little piece right there without these runners, they would just fly around as I so eloquently demonstrated. So once we have those runners in place, we'll lock in the actual work pieces and then send them over to the planer. The first pass through the planer is not going to take material off of our work pieces themselves, but only actually from the runners. These are sacrificial runners. As you can see right here, we haven't actually planed the top yet. But as we lower down the blades, we're going to take off more and more material, including, as you can hear right there, from the work pieces themselves. We now have a nice smooth surface up here. So that's nice and square. And on this one, we've just started to uh, make a dent here, but this one's a little thinner than this stock right here. So I'm actually gonna take this guy off uh, so that we don't needlessly plane it or smaller than it needs to be. Good luck. This Tape is really, really good, and it turns out it's really hard to get off. But the great news is once you start to unstick it, it doesn't leave any residue around. So it makes it uh, so you don't have to worry about somehow cleaning off your workpiece after you use it. Good stuff. I'm now going to break the board down a little bit further to make it more manageable for our scroll sawing exercise. So you can see now we have four pieces to choose from. 
The next step is going to be to take that pattern that I showed you earlier and actually glue it on and tape it on to one of these pieces. So that line that you see there over my shoulder, sorry about being in the way, is the fold line. And it's really critical that you fold precisely on that line. I actually spent a good deal of time really ensuring that was lined up before I spray mounted the paper onto the block of wood. Now we're going to put packing tape around it. Packing tape, I hear you cry. Why yes, it holds everything in place and also lubricates the blade. Does it really lubricate the blade? I have no idea, but we're gonna do it anyway. You just wanted to say lubricate the blade. The truth is I've actually really heard that that is very important to do. So not knowing any better, I'm going to do it. Now, the great thing about the scroll saw is that unlike a band saw, which has a continuous blade, a scroll saw is more like a jigsaw in that the blade moves just linearly. So as a result, you can actually insert the blade through a pilot hole like I'm drilling here and start your cut on an inner dimension as opposed to having to cut through the material to get to the inside. This is a huge advantage and really one of the best parts of scroll sign. Wait a minute, I thought you had one arm. How'd you turn that on while you're holding that thing? Now, if I ever want to like turn it off or anything, That's called putting your nose into it. Ah, uh, one-arm humor. But in all seriousness, it is kind of something that's important for me. I figure out how to do a lot of things like that using my nose, my feet, lots of different techniques. As you can see, we're really getting going here on the scroll sign, starting with that first inner dimension. The first hole. And now you can see in some detail what I was referring to about putting the blade through the pilot hole. Then I'll cinch it down with that thumb screw. And then tension it using the lever right there. If you get that hole lined up nicely, it actually won't move the wood up and down. But speaking of moving the wood up and down, the bad part about a scroll saw is as you can see, that lever is moving up and down with the blade. And the blade really wants to catch on things and move the workpiece up and down as well. So you have to hold that wood very, very hard against the surface of the scroll saw. And particularly as you're working through a larger height like I am here, it's very, very tiring on my arm. So you can see I do this in lots of little breaks and really put that nose trick into action uh, to get it to give myself a break and finish it on up. I wonder if there's something about the grain that made that so hard. No, it looks pretty even on the bottom. It's just you, Tim. Okay, well, there we have it. So now we've got holes and a hole. This will take some sanding, but that's okay. So the next step is going to be to actually cut out the main shape both the vertical and horizontal, or as I described earlier in the video, this way, then this way of the piece. And the trick in doing this is that you really need to make it as a single cut. And you'll see why in a moment, but you really can't take off a chunk and then do another piece as you go, like I would do with the bandsaw you really need to have it as one element. All right, 
first look at it. With how this is, how this is going. And it's going pretty well overall, I'd say. All right, my favorite thing, applying packing tape. This is a real chore, uh, but it's critically important because what you can see is I've actually put that piece I cut out back into the wood, which is why it had to be a single cut. And then using the packing tape again, I lock it in place so that as we do our vertical cut, not only are we taking material away from the block, we're actually taking material away from that piece I just cut out. This is the compound aspect of the compound scroll sign. Now in this case, you kind of can be a little bit more liberal in terms of having chunks fall out like that, although it's still not recommended because it's going to make it so that it's really hard to keep that piece engaged in the same spot. So again, you got to really do this in one one fell swoop. That little nozzle that you're seeing there is actually blowing air to clear dust away from your cut line so you can actually see it. That's pretty cool. A little bit more to do. Yeah. So it looks really cool now. However, what I want here is not a double infinity sign. What I want is a single three-dimensional loop that makes the infinity sign. So I'm carefully marking here where I need to cut away those chunks. And I'll cut some on this side and then cut the other side in the mirror image. It's a challenging cut because you have to be careful not to hit the other side as you're going. Now, look on the left-hand side here for a brief moment before I pick it up. That's where we've gotten to. But now, it's time to start sanding. Fun fact, you can actually get a sanding belt for a scroll saw. And so, uh, people who actually have done scroll sawing before may not even know that. It's super handy for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, it's very intricate, but the second one is what you're seeing here, which is that you can actually get to the inner parts of your workpiece, just like you can with that pilot hole and the saw blade. And so now I can actually work on the inner aspects of the piece, not just from the outside. Here's where we are. It's not perfect. But it's handmade. One handmade. And I'm going to do a bit more sanding. By a bit more sanding, I meant a ton more sanding. And you can see here, I've actually switched to files. And the reason I'm using these files is that they actually have some curvature to them. And so as I'm working on those inner curves of the piece, I'm able to make a nice smooth arc. And I sanded and filed, filed and sanded until. All right, so we have a pretty looking three-dimensional infinity sign complete. Now we need to finish it. And to that end, I have three possibilities. On the right here, it's uh, just oil-based polyurethane. On the left, tongue oil, which is something I have used to finish a lot of pieces in the past. And then in the middle here, I've never used it, but everyone seems to love it, Rubio Monocoat Pure. So using some scrap cutoffs from the project. I sanded them down and then tested first the tongue oil and then the Rubio Monocoat. Quick note to the product manager of Rubio Monocoat. Uh, this packaging is a nightmare and there's not any great instructions on how to open it, but it really does look beautiful. Let's have a look at them, shall we? So that's the tongue oil. Looks pretty good. That's the Rubio Monocoat. You can just see more of the grain with it. And that's the polyurethane. So we're definitely not gonna go with the spray poly. It looks cheap. There's a very good case to be made for the tongue oil. 
but I think this has got more natural beauty to it. So we're going to go with the Rubio. And here's something new I learned. I've never actually worked with such a small piece. And it's actually really hard to not be able to hold this as you apply the oil. So I tried a couple of different things and I was getting oil everywhere, but then I came up with a new technique. Hang it. And it was still kind of a pain to paint it uh, with that brush, but it worked. So that looked like it was really glossy, but like anything where you're using oil as a finish, you're gonna have to wipe that oil off. And when you do it, as you can see, it loses the sheen. And for a piece of jewelry, that wasn't gonna cut it. So even though I rejected this earlier, I'm gonna do a couple of coats with the spray polyurethane to try to make the piece glow. And before anyone asks, yes, that was ventilated in there. There's a big fan and, and so forth. All right, so after a couple of coats of the polyurethane semi-gloss, we are looking really, really nice. And so now the last step is going to be to make the, the necklace portion. I need to figure out what's going to go best together. It's not going to be the black. I'm thinking it's either this brown or this middle one, this light brown, which I'm actually leaning toward. So when I said the last step, what I really meant was, oh boy, this is going to be hard. It's a good thing I'm a woodworker and not a jewelry maker because one hand with this is really, really tricky. It's just such dexterous work that it becomes a real challenge. And it looks like I'm just enjoying a snack on this leather cordage. Uh, but in fact, what I'm doing there is I'm trying to fold it in half so that then I can wrap it around itself and create a, a knot on each side of the infinity sign. But I basically just made a mess. So let's try a different approach. I actually hung it from the soldering station clips and there you can see that I'm eating it again. And now for the second one, and as soon as we have this, we'll take a look at it. Well, step one is complete. Hopefully I can tighten up this leather over time. I'm not sure how exactly. Yeah, well, it turns out that really wasn't gonna work. I tried to tighten those knots and really hit a couple of dead ends. So I resorted to going to the internet and seeing what people who know what they're doing actually do. And what I found was that you actually create these wire wraps using 20 gauge wire. The woman I saw doing it used copper wire. Well, I didn't have any 20 gauge copper wire laying around, but I did have some galvanized steel wire laying around that happened to be 20, 20 gauge. So what you see here, it's perhaps a little bit more rustic than the copper would be, but it's a wooden piece and why not give that a go? All that said, this is really dexterous work and really hard. So that's where we got to. I'm gonna play with this a little bit more and see what I can figure out. Well, I didn't record it, but I made some progress. You can see what I did on the bottom. And I was attempting my second one, but my hand was getting really tired at this point. So I realized it was time to call in reinforcements. Oh my gosh. Well, I would use those pliers right there. Nice. So Eris has joined me to try to help finish this puppy off because man oh man, it is not easy to do. So thank you, honey. You're welcome. I, I feel you're gonna have to maybe do some editing because this is literally my first time doing this. Don't <laughs> worry about that. That's what I do for everything. Lots of editing, first time trying things most of the time. This technique right here I've learned is called smashing. 
smashing those wires together. While we're talking about smashing, don't forget to smash that like button. <laughs> And leave a comment below. That's right. Wow, look at that. Those fine motor skills. Well, after a good deal of effort. I'm going to go around a little bit more. Now I'm going to trim. We got to here, and it's really looking nice. Eris did a fantastic job. Gorgeous. Look at that sheen. Now we need to just tie it off on the end and we'll be done. Fingers need to work, work, work. Okay, so I got three loops and now through the tunnel. I don't think that's what she was saying, but that's what it made sense to me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like that? Yeah. Like that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, fingers crossed. Moment of truth. So those little knots were actually to make it so that you could expand the necklace. Okay. Ooh. And now... And cinch it tighter, as you can see right here. Now we'll get a close-up view. Nice. Ooh, so pretty to go with my pretty bride. Oh, and now we gotta zoom out, do your dance again. <laughs> Thanks for watching, everybody. Oh, this? You're wondering where I got this? You know, my husband made it for me. He's an artist and a craftsman.